First of all, let me say thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm, uh, I don't know if you know it or not. Some of you do, some of you don't. Former head of the FBI, Los Angeles, California, retired in 1979, March. And uh, shortly after my retirement, I was asked to investigate the Jeffrey R. McDonald case as a private investigator. He's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, February 17, 1970. The long story, I put in about 2,000 hours on the case. When the case uh, first began, my investigation first began, I uh, told Dr. McDonald that uh, I would investigate the matter for him. He had just been convicted and was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I think I'm going to sneeze. I didn't make it. Okay. Three consecutive life sentences. Uh, I told him if he, if I found out that he was guilty, I would no longer be on the case. I would drop my investigation. Much to my surprise, from the evidence that I read, information that I developed over a period of several years, I've established beyond any question of a doubt that this man is absolutely innocent. And on October 25, 1980, I obtained a signed confession from Helena Stokely, the girl in the floppy hat, if you know the case. By the way, uh, there was a best-selling book, Fatal Vision, and a movie out on this. And the girl in the floppy hat said that Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes. They were committed by my satanic cult group. And it was my initiation into the cult that night. And she gave me detailed information about the movement within the house that night, who did what. And I said to her, uh, Helena, how do I know you're telling me the truth? And so one of the questions I asked her, the whole series of questions I asked her, and this is on audio video in some instances the video, but always on audio. She said, uh, I said, Lena, tell me about the, describe the uh, jewelry box on the dresser in the master bedroom. And she described it right to a T. And just to make sure, I went down to Sears Roebuck and got a catalog and brought it back and I said, Lena, pick out the jewelry box in this catalog that was on the dresser. She picked out the jewelry box, it matched. Also, she told me that she attempted to ride a rocking horse in the child's bedroom that night, but she couldn't ride it because the spring was broken. The only way she could have known that spring was broken was to have been there the night of the murders, February 17, 1970. So anyway, uh, I submitted a 1,200 plus page report, actually 1,100 plus page, almost 1,200 pages, uh, in uh, March of 1981 to the FBI, Judge Webster with a personal letter, he was director of the FBI. And I said, Judge, I believe this man is innocent and uh, he'd run out of money and, you know, I've continued to work it as I usually do. And uh, I think that the FBI should continue along the lines of my investigation and much to my surprise, I started receiving, by the way, it also went to the FBI and to the U.S. Department of Justice, the Solicitor General's office. And much to my surprise, my witnesses, my 19 new witnesses, including Alina Stokely, started calling me and saying, uh, hey, Ted, the FBI has interviewed me. They're trying to get me to recant. And I'm saying to myself, that isn't the responsibility of the FBI. The FBI is supposed to gather information, not destroy it. And that was my first clue that we had a serious problem in that case. And then I continued on, and I had a number of other cases that I handled privately. And in each instance, I noticed the uh, evidence was lost, destroyed, stolen. Uh, I noticed uh, that there were strong indications of corruption. So I asked myself, now what's going on here? And over the years, I started gathering material until uh, about two years ago, up until about two years ago, I kept saying there's a loose knit a network operating in this country involving drugs, pedophilia, pornography, prostitution, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Two years ago, from my research, I'm convinced it's much more serious than that. It's more than a loose knit network. It is a conspiracy. And you know how the news media 
comes after us and we use the word C, conspiracy, that C word, well, they can come after me all they like because I guarantee you right here and now, we do have a conspiracy and I'm going to prove it to you here today. Now, one of the things that convinced me and really got me started in this regard, by the way, this conspiracy involves pornography, drugs, corruption, involves pedophilia, involves organized child kidnapping rings, the finders out of uh, Washington, D.C., CIA cover, covert operation, involved in the international trafficking of children, terrorism, bank accounts, and the word, and it goes on and on. By the way, I, I strongly urge you to go to my booth after this lecture and get my research, <laughs> my, my book and my research on missing children. We're going to go into that a little bit in the lecture. But my missing children lecture documents that the finders, an organization in Washington, D.C., the uh, CIA front, it's a covert operation. They're involved in the international trafficking of children. And I have a U.S. Customs report, official U.S. Customs report, in my book on the missing children. So I urge you to get it. It's only 10 bucks. Now, if you buy any of my products, any of my research, I beg of you, I don't want you to buy it unless you make a half a dozen copies and send it to your friends, okay? The name of the game with me is not copyright. I could care less about copyright. The name of the game is education, education, education. We need to know what's going on in this country today. So anything, any of my research that you buy, please make copies and get them out to your friends. That's what it's all about. After one of my lectures, here's about two years ago, this is why I changed my mind from, and using the word loose knit network to conspiracy. After one of my lectures, a gentleman came up and gave me a book. He said, Ted, in fact, that lecture was specifically on the McDonald case. Ted, here's what it's all about. Take this book and read it. And this is the book, folks. It's called Pawns in the Game. Now, if you don't know this book, you don't know of it, I urge you to, to buy it. I've been trying to buy it, but I noticed one of the vendors out here has it. And please, go get the copy of this book. I forget which vendor has it. Why? CPA book. Yeah. I noticed they had three copies. Are you with CPA book? Huh? Richard Flowers is CPA book. Richard Flowers. Go get this book when it's over and order some more copies. I'm going to order some myself and start selling them in my flyer. Anyway, it's called Pawns in the Game, and it's by William Guy Carr. William Guy Carr had the same problem I did. He wanted to know what's going on in America and in around the world. He was a Canadian, however, and as a result of his research, he wrote this book. So we have the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati uh, was established in 1776 by a fellow named Adam Weishoff. In 1773, he was commissioned by one of the Rothschilds, uh, House of Rothschild to put together an organization called the Illuminati. And he culminated his work in May the 1st, 1776. If you'll notice, that's a communist holiday. And uh, we're going to have to move along pretty fast. This is actually a four hour lecture I'm going to give you today. We're going to do it in probably an hour and 15, 20 minutes. But some of his goals. Uh, and the goals that he was commissioned to set up, there were 25 of them. And here they, they are right here. Here's the beginning of it right here. And then rather than read each one of them, I'm going to summarize it, okay? Because we've got a lot of work to get into. Number one issue was men are inclined to evil rather than good. Number two goal and issue was to preach liberalism. Number three, use the ideas of freedom to bring about class wars. That's what we're doing today. Number four, any and all means should be used to reach our goals uh, as they are justified, any and all means. Number five, their rights lie in force. That's we're talking about the Illuminati rights lie in force. Number six, the power of our resources must remain invisible 
until the very moment when it has gained the strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. And if you will notice, it's been a very, uh, no, very few people know about the Illuminati, so they have maintained their invisibility until most recently. Number seven, advocated mob psychology to obtain control of the masses. Number eight, use alcohol, drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice to systematically corrupt the youth of the nation. I mean, deep, I don't need to document that one about South Central LA, CIA drug operations coming in there. How about uh, Mena, Arkansas? Drugs coming into this country, arms and munitions going out. If you don't believe me, talk to Terry Reed, talk to Chip Tatum, talk to some of these other individuals who I know personally know. During the recent, last fall actually, drug hearings by Mr. Arlen Specter, Senator Arlen Specter, one of the big phonies of Washington, D.C., the magic bullet theorist. theorist. Uh, I watched those hearings, and I couldn't believe the mamby-pamby weak witnesses he brought forward, people that really had no direct knowledge of the drug operation. And that hearing was about bringing drugs into South Central L.A. by the CIA. I sent him a list of 16 names of people who had personal direct knowledge of drugs being brought into this country by the CIA. Never heard another word. None of those people ever appeared as witnesses. I might also mention in Oklahoma City, I sent my report, copy my report back to the committee. I sent them a fax and said I had information which would be vital to your investigation of the Oklahoma City bombing. That report, by the way, is also available to you. I urge you to buy it never received a response. Uh, number nine, seize property by any means. We're seeing that on a daily basis. Farmers, businessmen, people who are arrested for on nebulous charges, their property's being taken away from them. Here's an example right here, this lady right here. She lost everything, everything. They've come out and raided her house twice, Linda, twice, Linda. This lady had a house that she bought before her marriage. It was in her name, and they seized it. She no longer has that house. And number 10, deal with the use of slogans such as equity, liberty, fraternity into the mouths of the masses in psychological warfare. Boy, if that isn't Bill Clinton, I never saw it, never heard it before. That man is unbelievable. As uh, former Congressman Denemeyer describes him, he's a draft-dodging, womanizing, pathological liar, and he certainly fits into item number 10. Number 11, dealt with war, number 11 theory and goal. In 1773, Adam Weishoff set down policies that were publicly announced in 1939, folks. 1773, publicly announced 1939 by Britain and the United States. And the war should be directed so that <clears throat> The nations on both sides are placed further in debt and peace conferences conducted so neither combatants obtain territorial rights, Yalta. Perfect example, Stalin, Roosevelt, Winston Churchill after World War II. Number 12, told those present that they must use their wealth to have candidates chosen to public office who would be obedient to their demands and would be used as pawns in the game by the men behind the scenes. The advisors will have been bred, reared, and trained from childhood to rule the affairs of the world. We have that today without any question, the men behind the scenes. Number 13, control the press. If you heard my lecture yesterday on Oklahoma City, I documented that the mainstream media is being controlled by the big power people, by the phony politicians, by the bureaucrats, without any question about it. Information in the media, am I having an itchy nose today? Maybe I'm gonna kiss a fool or something, okay? Um, we have, we have a, a documentation of that, and I have that in one of my, some of my lecture material out here, and also my books. Number 14, their agent tours will come forward after fomenting traumatic situations and appear to be the saviors of the masses when they are actually interested in just the opposite, the killing of the masses. The riots in uh, Watts, the riots in South Central LA, folks. 
Number 15, create industrial depression and financial panic, unemployment, hunger, shortage of food. Use this to control the masses or the mobs and use the mobs to wipe out all those who dare to stand in the way. Well, I'll tell you right now, every expert I've talked to is talking about food shortage. And it's coming, I'm convinced. And we also know about the market crashing here in October. I had a market uh, specialist on my radio talk show, and if you don't listen to my show, I urge you to, because it's a real good, solid education for you. Just this week, George Green, he was also on my show on October the 6th. George told us on October the 6th there would be a crash of the market in October. It came. Now he told us this week there will be another crash, and it will drop he thinks 2,000 points. So we'll see what happens. I hope it isn't true. Number 15, create industrial depression and financial panics. Unemployment, I've already covered that. Number 16, infiltrate into the secret Freemasonry to be used for their purposes. That's been documented many times. Number 17, expound the value of systematic deception. Use high sounding slogans and phrases and advocate lavish promises to the masses even though they cannot be kept. Again, Bill Clinton. Uh, George Bush was good at that too, by the way. What's the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats high up? Nothing. Zero. You know, uh, Mr. A, who has a booth next to mine, Mysterious Mr. A, he uh, talks about um, subliminal messages. If you look at the logo of the Republican Party, you know the elephant with the three stars across the top? Well, if you look at it today compared to two years ago, the stars have been inverted. The point used to be at the top two years ago. Now, the point's at the bottom. Satanic folks, I can't say for sure, but that's a subliminal message. Inverted stars. Number 18, detailed plans for resolution. Discuss the art of street fighting, which is necessary to bring the population to a speedy subjection. Number 19, use their agent tours as advisors behind the scenes after wars through secret diplomacy to gain control. Number 20, establish huge monopolies toward um, world government control. We're, we're seeing that today, the huge monopolies. Number 21, use high taxes and unfair competition to bring about economic ruin by controlling raw materials, organize agitation among the workers and subsidizing competitors. GATT, NAFTA. Number 22, build up armaments with police and soldiers sufficient to protect our interests. In uh, a few years ago, we had 11 federal agencies that were authorized to carry sidearms, firearms. Now we have 39. Number 23, members and leaders of the One World Government would be appointed by the director. Okay, uh, Presidential Directive 25 allows the president, my, by the way, this is uh, classified, secret, not available to the general public, allows and orders that the president of the United States in the event of a conflict or a crisis in this country transfers the power, his powers, over to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Number 24, infiltrate into all classes and levels of society of government for the purpose of fooling, bemusing, and corrupting the youth members of society by teaching them theories and principles that we know to be false. This is the outcome-based education program being shoved down our throats by the United Nations. Number 25, national and international laws should be used to destroy civilization. There's talk about the world population being decreased to 500 million, the United States population being decreased to 20 million. And uh, we look at the... Uh, uh, the war that we had in the Gulf, Gulf War Syndrome. Look at the people that died there. There were 700,000 troops, American troops there. Four-fifths of them today cannot even do a push-up because they're so ill and so sick. They've been washed out of the service. We have a new army, basically. And um, the story goes on and on. Okay. What's... Uh, what are we talking about here? There's a, a considerable overlap uh, in the United States from the various groups, organizations, individuals, whatever you want to call it. But one of the driving forces behind this movement, the Illuminati, 
is the satanic cult movement in this country today. Now, I, when Alina gave me that signed statement, I said, what in the world is this all about? I don't know anything about Satanism. I'd heard the word, and that's about it, from the Bible, of course. So I began my little journey forward. And one of my, one of the matters that I developed information about was an individual I learned about was Alistair Crawley. He likes to be, have his name pronounced Crowley to rhyme with holy. And uh, the Satanists today, and for the number of years in the past, have basically used his philosophy and his writings as a guide. And uh, so uh, let's talk about some of his writings and teachings. And here we have of the bloody sacrifice, And here we have, the blood is the life. And here on page 94 of his book, it would be unwise to condemn as irrational the practice of those savages who tear the heart and liver from an adversary and devour them while yet warm. In any case, it was the theory of the ancient magicians that any living being is a storehouse of energy varying in quantity according to the size and health of the animal and in quality according to its mental and moral character. At the death of the animal, this energy is liberated suddenly. The animal should therefore be killed within the circle. That's, we're talking about the satanic circle. The, uh, or the triangle, as the base may be, so that its energy cannot escape. An animal should be selected whose nature accords that with that of the ceremony. Thus, by sacrificing a female lamb, one would not obtain any appreciative <coughs> quantity of the fierce energy useful to a magician who was invoking Mars. In such a case, a ram would be more suitable, and this ram should be virgin. The whole potential of its original, original uh, total energy should not have been diminished in any ways. And now listen to this sentence, folks, closely. For the highest spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable system. We're talking about human sacrifices. There are, in my estimation, over three million practicing Satanists in America today. Now, how did I come up with those figures? I have informants. I have an informant in South Central L.A., population of 200,000, told me there are 3,000 practicing Satanists in that area. That's where the famous, well-known uh, case, um, uh, McMartin case on the preschool took place. <clears throat> I have an informant in Lincoln, Nebraska, told me 3,000 practicing Satanists. Lincoln, Nebraska, town of 200,000, South Bay area, Manhattan Beach area, about 200,000. How much time? I'm getting, I get more than an hour today. So just crank up your cameras. Huh? I'm gonna take an hour and a half. Okay. I'm gonna take every, every minute I can give to you folks because you need to soak this into your brain. Uh, Iowa City, Iowa, town of 150,000. Uh, excuse me, 100,000. 1,500 informants. That averages out about 1.5% of the population. Anyway, uh, this is, uh, we're talking about uh, human sacrifice. About 50,000, 50 to 60,000 individuals are sacrificed every year. There are eight basic satanic holidays. There are other holidays for the various covens, but there are eight basic ones that they all honor. Now, one of the practices, this is another book of Aleister Crawley, one of the theories, we talked about human sacrifice, okay, there it is, it's right in their book. I mean, I didn't invent that, that's there. Another, another aspect of their religion, if you want to call it religion, by the way, the federal government does recognize the satanic movement as a religion, yet in Linda's case, the word Satanism was brought up by her husband's defense attorney. They sealed the records, have not made it available, and when he, she writes to her children and says, believe in God, she gets a letter back from these people saying, you can't mention God in your letter to your children. That's just an example, okay? Okay, this is, we're talking here about the 
666, that's the, the beast, that's Alistair Crowley er, uh, himself. Moreover, the B666 advises that all children shall be accustomed from infancy to witness every type of sexual act, as also the process of birth, less fog, falsehood fog, and mystery stupefy their minds, whose error else might thwart and misdirect the youth of their, the growth of their subconscious system of self-symbolism. What we're talking about there is children from birth being exposed to sex. These people, the satanic movement in the world, has set up preschools throughout the world for the purpose of getting their hands on our children. The parents drop them off at 9 in the morning, come back and pick them up at 4, 3, 4, 5 at night. In the meantime, in many of these preschools, the children are exposed to sex from the time of birth. In Linda Wiegand's case, it's exactly what happened. These children have been exposed to sex from the time that her ex-husband got his hands on those babies right up to the present time. And I have a page missing, and I'll have to dig that one up some. I don't know what happened to that page. Maybe the Satanist got it. It may therefore be considered improper as a general rule for your sexual gratification to destroy, deform, or displease any other star. Mutual consent to the act is the condition thereof. It must, of course, be understood that such consent, and we're talking about sex now, is not always explicit. There are cases where seduction or rape may be emancipation or in, uh, initiation to another. Such acts can only be judged by the result. What they're saying is, it's all right to rape somebody. I mean, if they don't consent, it's all right to rape them because it's for the cause. Let's talk about the McMartin case. In uh, April 1985, uh, authorities went to the McMartin case and looked for tunnels under the school. The children had said that they were taken into tunnels under the school. There was a chamber down there. They were sexually molested. They involved, that involved ceremonies, adults with robes, candles, chanting. Adults had no clothes on under their robes. And they were taken up into a tunnel and a triplex, a bathroom trap door of the triplex next door. They were taken out in automobiles. We're talking about two, three, four-year-old children, folks, and, and, and prostituted in the community. The authorities uh, received this complaint in 1983. They began their investigation. The authorities finally in 1987, 85, excuse me, went out and decided to look for the tunnels because they said the children were hallucinating. The children also said that they were taken by air up into a mountainous area where they were exposed to satanic ceremonies based on what they described and brought back in time for the parents to pick up the kids. So the authorities didn't find anything. Uh, we're getting off, to pull those next slides. Well, I'll tell you what, in the spring of 1993, I heard that the property of the McMartin School had been sold from the McMartin family to the defense attorney, actually given to him. He didn't make enough off the county. His bill was only $3 million. And from there, he said he was broke and he sold it to a contractor. The contractor was going to build an office building on the space. And uh, I heard that uh, the contractor had this property, and so I went out and contacted him. And I said, uh, dear sir, I would like to have access to that property. He said, I'll give you two weeks. I signed a contract, assumed liability, and along with some of the parents, we hired an archaeologist from UCLA, Dr. Gary Stickle, knowing full well that I'm not qualified to say there's tunnels under, under there even if I found them. And we began our dig. At the end of two weeks, I had to stall, 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 because Dr. Stickle was not quite ready to admit there were tunnels. It took us 34 days. At noon, the 34th day, with the bulldozers, with their motors running, ready to knock the building down, he was going to knock the building down and then build this office building, Dr. Stickle said, you know, I can say without any question right now, there have been tunnels under the school. They were filled in. Now, I'm going to show you the documentation on the tunnels. This is it. No, keep it there. Keep that there. 
Uh, this is the, uh, what we found. This is a preliminary report. I have a 186-page scientific report available to you out here if you're interested, by the way. We found a nine-foot wide subterranean entrance under the west wall of Dog Room. There were four classrooms. That was Ray Bucky's room. By the way, Virginia McMartin and Ray Bucky were tried. Virginia, uh, the grandmother, was acquitted. Ray had a hung jury. And we found these tunnels in the middle of the second trial of Ray Bucky. They could have been used to convict him. We called the prosecutor. He sent his investigator out, Mr. Perez. Mr. Perez told me, I don't want you entering in my conversation with, this, with the archaeologist. I said, why? He says, you're too argumentative. And I said, well, okay, you go in and talk. I'll just keep my mouth shut. We went in, he talked, and he, he argued with the archaeologist. Here's an investigator not qualified to talk about tunnels. He said, there aren't any tunnels there, and the archaeologist, of course, argued. But anyway, they didn't use that evidence, strong evidence, in the second trial. They ignored it, right in the middle of the second trial. I might mention this. The children identified professional football players, professional uh, baseball players, household name actors, actresses, and the son of the leading politician, not a leading politician, the leading politician in Los Angeles as being perpetrators. Okay, we found, uh, we found an avocado tree root cut on both sides of the entrance, and I'll show you this in just a few minutes. Uh, the entrance of the tunnel, as I said, it was nine feet across the top, and on one side was a live avocado root, on the other side was a dead, avo a dead av avocado root. They had to cut that out. We have, we have this, by the way. We found a plastic Disney bag, copyright 1982, about four and a half feet below the classroom floor, and three to six uh, inches in from the entrance and under the foundation. Now, the reason that plastic Disney bag is so important is because we think that they filled the tunnel in in 1982 when the complaint was initially brought to the attention of the authorities. I said 83 earlier, it's 82 when the complaint was made. And when they filled it in, the plastic Disney bag somehow or other flew in there as they were filling it in and nobody noticed it. Now, who says there is no God, right? What documentation, fantastic documentation, that that tunnel, the entrance to that tunnel, this is right at the entrance, was filled in in 1982 or sometime subsequent to 1982. Mr. Ken Lanning, the outstanding know-it-all FBI expert, behavioral science, says that I took that garbage bag in 1993 out of a trash can and placed it there, that I planted evidence. Of course, Mr. Lanning says there's no organized satanic movement in this country today. There's only a few dabblers here and there. Thank you, sir. We have another three hours to go, okay? Can you hang in there? Okay, uh, the tunnel proceeded south, then 45 feet through classroom four and three and north, then uh, 10 feet within the classroom four. The tunnels were 30 inches wide, 44 to 46 inches deep, with the top of the tunnel 30 inches under the classroom floor. The children were able to walk through it. We're talking about young kids now, right? The adults had to stoop down and walk through it, but they could do it. Uh, the tunnels were built in a... In a in kind of a triangular, or I should say a semi-circle type, so that they had natural support, I guess. These people know everything. They are brilliant. Uh, the uh, footing between classroom three and four was arched, where the tunnel passed underneath it, and 12 inches shorter in depth at this location than the same footing 12 feet to the north. I'll show you that in just a minute. That's significant, because the arch was where the, the tunnel went and it was arched in that particular location, whereas uh, 12 feet uh, away, it was 12 inches longer or thicker. Uh, <clears throat> footing between, uh, let's see, uh, there were four large upright containers were found in the tunnel under the arch, obviously hand-placed. A nine-foot wide chamber was found along the tunnel across classroom four. The top of the chamber and the top of sections of the tunnel had layers of plywood covered with tar paper which had apparently been supported by cinder blocks and two-by-two two and two-by-four wooden posts found underneath. Tunnel features made it evident that the tunnels had been hand-dug. The, uh, the seven-foot tunnel extended into the triplex next door. The tunnel extended from the bathrooms off the office and classroom one to the front yard of the triplex next door. Front yard concealed from the street by a three-car garage. 
Children described the entrance and exiting tunnels in the triplex yard exactly where the tunnels and exit were found. A 39 by 41 inch area under a hole cut in this neighbor's bathroom floor had been excavated and subsequently tilled. Now, that was where the kids, the kids told us ahead of time that they were taken out up in a trap door in this bathroom. And uh, there was a crawl space in the house about like this, and we got one of our skinny archaeologists to go in there, take pictures. The bathtub protruded underneath the floor of the bathroom. There was a bathroom in the back of the same building in another apartment. It did not protrude there. This was the space we're talking about, 39 by 41 inches. Just enough room for a kid to come up and be taken out. Other significant facts, small white plastic plate with three pentagrams, hand drawn on the top of the light green paint was found by the archeologists. Uh, pentagrams had, were hand drawn by an adult and not part of the manufacturer's design. Many other artifacts were found whose analysis will be released upon completion of the test. The analysis has been released. That's the scientific report I told you about. Uh, no doorknobs were on classroom three, only a dead bolt lock. Each classroom had an on and off switch, which was labeled fire alarm. The system did not connect to the fire station, but was used as an alert within the school if somebody came around. More than 2,000 artifacts were found under the, floor, the school floor, including over, 200, over 100 animal bones. Uh, due to the constraints and time constraints and so forth, we had to discontinue uh, the process on noon the 34th day. By the way, this uh, cost us, a lot of people donated their time. Uh, it still costs us money. It costs us between $55,000 and $60,000. Um, I personally put in $17,000, which I ended up, uh, in many instances, paying over a, a long-term period uh, payment plan. This is the uh, floor plan of the whole lot. There is, right there, the building itself, this is the entrance, the concrete slab, a vacant lot there. This is a, a, a yard. And here's the avocado tree we're talking about. And here's the entrance right there. Now here is the tunnel. It came in here, extended here and here. And here's the chamber across here. We think, but didn't have time to explore this. The tunnel went up here. Now we definitely were able to come up with it here, right here. And it came into the bathroom over here. Okay. There's the entrance. It's nine feet across here. I'll show you a diagram in a few minutes. There's the avocado tree. Those roots are live. Over here, we had a dead avocado root. Okay, next. There's a, uh, a plate that was found in the play yard, buried about six inches under the sand with the pentagram on it. That's right. And here's a diagram of the tunnel. This is the entrance to the tunnel. Now that's the floor, the footing for the classroom four. Here's the plastic Disney bag it was located right there, partially under the footing and partially out. And this AF means artificial fill. And this was the shape of the entrance. Okay. Here's your diagram. These are your uh, drawings. Artificial fill. Here's the avocado root there. Here's the dead root over there. Distance 120 or 21 inches below and 14 inches below the footing. Uh, there's the avocado root there, live avocado root. And these are all diagrams by the archaeologists. Good documentation. There's the roots themselves. That shows you the size, two, two centimeters. Next. There's the plastic Disney bag. Turn it over. There's the plastic Disney bag. Disney classroom 82, 83. Sandwich bag, it was a sandwich bag. Um, this is, shows the arch of the tunnel. Now the school was built in 1966 which means the foundation were laid, was laid then. And here's your arch. And this is the, from classroom four here into classroom three over here. And it was 12 inches higher over to the left. Go ahead. There's yours truly looking up. 
Uh, this was in classroom four, as I recall, and this is where the tunnel extended, right along here. Now, the reason the tunnel's been filled in, you have to understand that, and the reason the archaeologists could say that they were filled in is because the texture of the dirt that had been filled in was different than the natural texture. Okay. Just turn it off for a minute. In addition to the tunnels, I developed information that an abandoned satanic site was in Crestline, California. Crestline, California is in the mountains. The kids said, remember a few minutes ago, they were flown by jet, or flown, they didn't say jet, into the mountains. There's an airport 10 minutes from the McMartin Preschool. It's Hawthorne Airport. There's a landing strip in Crestline. I heard about this abandoned satanic site, and I went up to the site, took pictures. And this is what I, by the way, before I go on with this, I called the prosecutor in the McMartin case. And I told her, hey, I think I know where the children were taken. If they weren't, it's certainly worth looking at. And I will be glad to make this information available to you. And if you want to have the children go up and look at this abandoned satanic site, we can. She said, we're not interested. They weren't interested in hardcore evidence, the tunnel. They weren't interested in this abandoned satanic site. Go ahead. This is what we found. 666, one of the satanic signs. That's a stone on the site. The house was up, had been up here. The day after the McMartin case broke in the news, the house burned to the ground. And, uh, and it was here, the streets on the other side of the hill. You cannot see the site, this area down in here, from the street. You have to go in, would have had to go in through the house and come down. And this, you can see it's quite elaborate. There's my associate, Judy Hansen, who works with me in LA. And uh, next. This is uh, looking at the opposite direction of the picture we just took. And you can see there's San Bernardino down in there. And uh, you can see that uh, on the side of a mountain like that, nobody's going to find it unless you fly over with a helicopter. That's probably an altar, flattened stone. Uh, also an altar, another altar that had been broken. Uh, this is, uh, of course, you recognize the star. Now, this is a satanic symbol. Put the next one up. Hold the first one. There it is, right there. Put the other first one back on. Now overlay them. Turn it around that way. Okay, any question about that, folks? No. Now let's read what that says. Am's day, As Asmo day, a strong and powerful king appears with three heads, the first like a bull, the second like a man, the third like a ram. He has a serpent's tail, the web feet of a goose, and he vomits fire. He rides the infernal dragon, carries lance and pennon, and is the chief of the power of Ammon. He must be invoked, be bareheaded, or otherwise he will deceive. He gives the ring of virtues, teaches arithmetic, uh, geometry, and other handicrafts, answers all questions, makes men invisible, indicates the place of concealed treasures, and guards them if within the domain of the Amamon. Oh, what do we got here? Another satanic symbol. You think that wasn't a satanic site? Overlay it. Okay. Is that it? The other way around, isn't it? Yeah, flip it around. Okay, there you go. Okay, now let's read what that one, what that uh, sign means. That is the seal of Amsman scale. I, I guess I, no, that's the wrong, that's the one before. Belial, a mighty king created next after Lucifer, appears in the form of a beautiful angel seated in a chariot of fire and speaking with a pleasant voice. He fell first amongst the superior angels who went before Michael and other heavenly angels. He distributes pr uh, uh, pref preferences of senatorships, causes favors of friends and foes, and gives excellent families familiar. He must have offering and sacrifices made to him. Next. And there's another satanic sign. I couldn't make that one out, so I couldn't match it with anything. 
obviously. Here's some ovens. That was a large, large circle with a number of signs in it, a lot of writing. Uh, we couldn't get up high enough that we could uh, take a good picture of it. Next. And let's put that, put that back a minute. That's another case. Okay, uh, nothing came of that. Uh, nobody was interested in an abandoned satanic site, even though it appears to have been related to the McMartin case. Um, I have to say that uh, I was very disappointed. We gather this evidence privately. The police don't have the capability of doing so. Too many high-pressure people involved. Too many prominent individuals involved. Uh, so that's just, in this, uh, uh, that's just an overview of the McMartin case, folks. Uh, no question in my mind uh, that uh, it was uh, a satanic operation. And Dr. Roland Summit, uh, UCLA psychiatrist, says, who's done a lot of research in this field also, that there are 50 other preschools in the country where the kids have talked about going down into tunnels. Now, this is another case that I worked out of Philadelphia, similar case to Linda's. And this is the Lou Bear case. Lou called me back in, I guess, the late 80s. And uh, he said that uh, he had uh, gone underground with his children. The, the great FBI came in with their SWAT team, as they did with Linda, raided his house, grabbed him, put him in jail, took the children, turned them over to his ex-wife, whose boyfriend, according to the children, was sexually molesting them. And uh, Lou said, what can I do and how can you help me? So I was willing to go back and testify for Lou. And uh, one of the uh, matters that I was going to testify about was the drawings by the kids. And it's a, not a funny thing, but it's an established fact that children who have sec been sexually molested, for some reason or other, when they're, you know, two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten years old, whatever, will invariably draw pictures of their activity, of this activity, of their exposure to these nefarious uh, matters. Invariably they do that. Now when I was that age, I was drawing cars and airplanes, and the girls were drawing flowers, right? But these kids invariably will draw these pictures. As you can see from Linda's case, she has pictures at her booth that her children have drawn. Now this was a, I was going to go back and testify for Lou, and I was going to say that based upon my reviewing the pictures drawn by the children, they've been exposed to a satanic activity. This is the most telltale of all the pictures. You're gonna, I'm going to show you a series of them. This is a totem pole with a goat's head at the top, children at the various highest level. I understand, again, I'm, I, I say I understand because I'm not sure because there's so much secrecy involved in the satanic movement. Eight, ten layers of classes of people within themselves, like the dabblers on up to the very highest level. But from my sources and my informants, I've been told that the very highest level of Satanism, you will have the totem pole, which is usually three to six feet tall, made out of wood, with the goat head at the top. So I was going to testify that based on my experience, that these children were exposed to the highest level of Satanism, because, mainly because of this drawing right here, the goat hole, the, the totem pole with the goat's head. The judge would not allow me on the witness stand. I flew all the way to Philadelphia, from Los Angeles wouldn't allow me to testify. These are some of the other drawings. Uh, this is a, a body on a, on a slab, on, undoubtedly an altar where they sacrifice in blood. The genitals, and let me mention this also, children who have never been sexually molested in a recent study, not a recent study, a study back about seven or eight years ago, Children who have never been sexually molested do not draw the genitals. Children who have been sexually molested, a high percentage of them draw the genitals, and so children who have been ritualistically sexually molested, a high, higher percentage will draw the, the, the uh, genitals. Uh, little Matt Bear drew a picture of people, a fire, baby being thrown in the fire, human sacrifice, obviously. An altar, bone, liver, blood, kitty. And another uh, 
ritual of ceremony. Here's trees, people, fire. And another, people have no cloth on, he says. Table, knife, devil. Okay, that's the Lou Bear case. Now, I think we're gonna just, we, we got just a few more minutes and I want Linda to take the podium, talk about her case. But I'm gonna run through these next slides real fast, Linda. 100,000 children disappear every year per Reader's, per Reader's Digest, July 1982. Next. This is the official U.S. Customs Report that establishes the great CIA under the name Finders, a covert operation is involved in the international trafficking of children. It's about nine or 10 pages long. We'll just flip through the pages. If you want to take a look at this report, go to my table and take a look at it. And if you want, please buy it. It's $10. Make copies, get it out to your friends. Okay, keep going. Just go real quick. Keep, again, keep going. Go to the last page. Just flip them and then just go to the last page. That's how long it is. Keep going. And some more. That's it, that's it. Okay. The way this case came about is uh, a group of children were seen in a park in Tallahassee, Florida in 1987. The uh, police were called. The men were well-dressed, they had a van. Police came out, talked to the kids. The kids said that they were en route to Mexico to a smart school. And the police traced that van back up to the Finders in Washington, D.C. They raided the Metropolitan Police Department, raided the Finders headquarters and also a warehouse. And they found all this paraphernalia. They found information about international trafficking of kids all over the world. The Finder, based on my research subsequent to that, again, CIA covert operation. The customs agent, was called into it because of the possibility of pornography, and I guarantee that there was pornography involved. Guarantee, okay? Now, this report, this was his report. Again, this is available, Missing Children, $10 in my booth. This report is the final interview by the customs agent when he attempted to go over and get more information than he'd already developed. Okay, let's just go over this. Leave it there, leave it there, yeah, leave it there. Okay. April 2, I arrived at the Metropolitan Police Department at approximately 9 a.m. Detective Bradley was not available. He was the detective who was supposed to help him. I spoke to a third party who was willing to discuss the case with me on a strictly off-the-record basis. I would advise that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State, they found, uh, they found uh, passports in the van. The uh, State Department, in turn, advised the Metropolitan Police that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam during the late 50s and mid-70s. Folks, it was illegal to travel there, travel there to those countries during that period. The individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police report had been classified secret and was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior, and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's the FBI headquarters, by the way, had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office, that's the field office, of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. No action will be taken. The case was closed, and here we have a CIA internal matter. The finders... Group, the Finders case organization was founded by a CIA agent back in the early 60s, and here we are, 1987, still operating. I have the man's name, I have all the information on it. A real quick overview, CIA experiments with mind control on children, MK Ultra. This is an outstanding article, it's, again, it's available in that same report, just flip, flip the pages. Keep going. Okay. Folks, I'm going to turn the podium over to Linda Wiegand. We have about another 15, 20 minutes, I believe. And Linda's going to talk about her case. This is one of the most classic examples of corruption I have ever seen. And believe me, you can tell from my lecture that I've seen some pretty awful examples of corruption. Go on, Linda. Linda Wiegand, my friend, 
God bless her. She's a fighter. I'm here to tell you I'm a living, breathing example of what happens when a satanic cult abuses your children. And sometimes I put slides above the abuse, but um, uh, after seeing the slides of the children this morning, I think you understand what this is about. And there's pictures over at the booth right out here. The devil to me, maybe 10 years ago, was something that was, uh, oh, I went to Catholic church. I'm still Catholic and Christian. I went to church and the devil was something out there that you didn't want to talk about at night and you know you didn't talk about in the dark and it was just something in science fiction movies. My children disclosed just sexual abuse in early 1993. They were masturbating, they were pulling their pants down at the uh, supermarket. They started having oral sex with my St. Bernard, inserting, uh, inserting pens and pencils into the dog's rectum. The behavior got worse and worse and worse. I woke up one morning. I don't usually talk about this stuff. I woke up one morning to the bread, um, you know, the butcher block that you cut bread on, because I'm a vegetarian, so it wasn't a butcher block. And there was a huge bread knife in the middle of the butcher block with a big pool of ketchup in the middle of it. And that was on my kitchen table. And I said to my children, what is this? Who did this? What, what does this mean? And my son John said, Mom, this is some of the things that we have to see and that have been done to us. I knew I had a big, big problem, and I had no idea what it was called. I called all over the country. I had children's drawings for the police. My husband was under arrest for sodomy and oral sex with my children. And I had all kinds of drawings that had circles and people with, uh, there was black candles always in the middle of these tables and, and all this uh, oral and anal sex pictures. And I went to the Catholic Church and I said, I don't know what this is, but it seems to me these, these drawings are significant. There are all kinds of symbols I don't understand and, and uh, devil heads and, and goat's heads. And I had no idea what, I did not know what satanic ritual abuse was church asked me if I ever had a psychiatric exam and um, I said actually I'm completely sane I just know that there's symbols in these pictures no one would help me even though there was a prosecution going on they said if you ever bring up satanic ritual abuse your credibility is lost and you'll just be a kook and it doesn't exist and it's not organized in America just focus on child sexual abuse so I took my children to a child sexual abuse hospital and while they were being treated, and I had legal custody of my children, and my husband and his lawyers and the judge found out my children were in a, an expert hospital, they confiscated my house, everything I've ever owned, from my baby pictures to my clothes. I walked away with literally the clothes we had on our backs, took my cars, my federal post office box mail, my income, my assets. I lost everything by taking my children to an expert on child abuse. It was trying to stop me from what my children could disclose from being uncovered, to try and just break that we had no assets to have my children have medical attention. The children were being treated for sexual abuse, and I had provided all the documentation. And one day, the doctor said to me, I need you to come into my office. She said, this is a classic case of SRA. I had no idea. I mean, SRA, is that like an Irish uh, Republican Army thing? I don't know what SRA is. She said, satanic ritual abuse. And she showed me the drawings that the children were doing her office. And they were of blood sacrifice, of people cutting their arms and dripping blood in chalices, of chalices with devil heads, and on and on and on. It includes group sex. It includes children being killed. And I remember I just felt like my guts were just punched out of my body. I did not know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I called every organization in the country asking for help, children's organizations. And no one wants to acknowledge satanic ritual abuse. And all the child abuse organizations only say that they lobby. They don't actually help people. And so my quest to save my children has taken me here. And as a consequence, and I can tell you here today, there are other mothers who are here today to ask me for help, who have children that were 
victims of satanic ritual abuse. And it's really hard for me because I'm only one person and my life has been annihilated, although I, I have to say it's being rebuilt for the better. But John and Ben, my boys, are 11 and 8 and have lived for 15 or 16 months in the home of a satanic abuser who has been documented as a member of a cult, who 25 people in the state's attorney in Connecticut are investigating and have substantiated sexual abuse and the cult, and yet the governor and no one has been acting to protect my children. So it makes me wonder just how high this goes. But I'll tell you a story about a little boy that affected my life, and I guess it's besides John and Ben, who I always think about and who I want to stop this from ever happening to another child again. I heard a story about a little eight-year-old boy. His mom had taken him to protect him, and they were found. And I had been underground for three years, by the way. The mother and this little boy were found. The little boy was taken to a basement. He was crucified alive. First, he was skinned. When they torture the children, it causes a physical reaction of the endomorphins in your body to just increase because of the terror and the pain. So when the Satanists drink the blood, they actually get like a chemical, re you know, a high, like a drug high from the blood of a tortured victim. And this little boy was found in the basement dead with no blood, skinned alive and crucified. This cannot happen to any more children. I can't do it alone. My children are there. It's really hard. I need each one of you to know this is not a fairy tale. This is not something out of science fiction. I was a mom who ran a charity and baked oatmeal cookies for my kids. And because my children are victims, I have to stand here and I have to tell you these horrible stories. And I could tell them all day and all night because both Ted and I get letters and calls for people begging for help all over the country right now. And the only way we can help them is to help save John and Ben first, set the precedence. We will not tolerate this anymore, not only to the children, but to our own lives. And we will not tolerate this. We must stand together. And I ask you to please, especially prayer and donations and letters, and help me save John and Ben. And then the rest of us are forming a task force to go around the country and start saving everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Uh, folks, thanks for very much. You, any of you have any questions? I guess there's no microphones up here, but uh, go ahead, Renee. Just come down here in front and yell at me. It's, uh, it's immediately behind this curtain on the left. And if you can just go put a few dollars in the basket there, it'll help. Uh, what we have uh, now is uh, we have a team of investigators organized in Connecticut. Many of them are working on a voluntary basis. Some are charging a minimal amount, a discount rate. We have attorney fees. We have uh, filing fees to file the civil rights federal uh, violation a case against the four judges and uh, the state of Connecticut which was filed here about 10 days ago cost us a thousand dollars we served uh, the four judges two attorneys and uh, the governor with letters just about two days ago telling them unless they release the oldest boy back to Linda by the way this boy is not the biological son of the ex-husband he never adopted this child. Unless they release this child back, we're going to file criminal felony charges against the judges and the governor and others in the state of Connecticut. And we're not kidding. We're going to do it, OK? We have been working uh, with uh, a friend of mine. I brought him into the case, Jack Firm, a paralegal, Las Vegas. And he's probably one of the most brilliant men I've ever known. He's doing circles around these attorneys who have taken thousands of dollars, by the way. And he is really 
uh, responsible for what's happening today more than anybody else. We're, you know, we're all a team, but still he's the one main man in the arena as far as the law is concerned. Any other questions that we have? Yes, come on up to the microphone, please. Come, come to the microphone, because they, they need to get this recorded. We listen, to your story. we listen to your stories, and we wonder if this happens to us or our family or anything. Where would you go and who would you go to? You quit the FBI. Terry Reid quit. And you imply that the governor, right on down, and, you know, the president and all are crooked at the dog's hind leg. Who would you talk to if you had a problem tomorrow? Uh, who would you talk to if you had a problem tomorrow? Um, give me a call. I help as all the best I can. Uh, I have a network of people that can probably help you. I have a number of people contact me over the last several years, and I refer them to other experts. And we'll have to take each case at a time, but if we can help you, just give us a call. I have a flyer out here. Uh, it's got my phone number on it. No, I'm referring to uh, something happens here in Denver. I need help. Do I call the police? Do I call the governor? Who do I call? If they're all crooked, as you implied, and I believe you, you go to them and you know, they draw a line and say, we're not going to investigate. What do you do? Well, that's why I'm saying call me. Because we have the network of people, and uh, we're in the, for in the process of forming a foundation, uh, and we're going to be seeking some money to finance it. And as Linda said, we're going to have a task force that will go around the country and handle these problems. Probably going to be busier than the one on paper hanger. Uh, but uh, just give us a call. We'll do what we can to help you. We'll, we'll try to help you. Can you go to the police? Yes. Go to the police. Make a matter of record. What I suggest you do with the police is go talk to them personally and then go back and write a letter, confirm your conversation, send it registered mail so you have it on record. Anybody you talk to in these type cases, make sure you have it a matter of record. Certified mail. Yes, question. Yes, will you uh, name public profile figures that were uh, suspects out in the California case? You know, the people that were named by the children? Are you, can you do that? No, I can't name them because uh, I can't prove it. All I can tell you is what the kids said. And the kids, uh, they basically have said that the children were not credible. And um, I think if I said anything, I'd be open myself to a lawsuit. I'm very, I'm not afraid. If I, if I could name them without being sued, I would. But uh, believe me, they're very prominent people. They're household words. Um, what, uh, what elements of of possible satanic um, abuse do you see in the John Bonet case? Uh, interesting question. What elements of possible satanic activity do I see in the Bonet case? Um, I can't prove it. From the day that case broke in the news until today, I see uh, signs of it, indications of it. Uh, the tourniquet around the little girl's neck. Uh, one of the practices that they have in their mind control uh, activity and is to take a child right up near death and then bring them back from close to death. I would suspect that that's a possibility here, that this child, they took this child too far and the child passed away. I don't know again, but uh, I'm, I'm saying based on my experience and expertise, good possibility of that. Uh, I'd say there's a good possibility that, uh, in fact, I'm confident that the family knows much more than what they're telling. Um, the fact that uh, they were not cooperative through uh, for a number of months would indicate that. My instincts tell me that. Uh, I would have to say she was probably a victim of a pedophile operation or a pedophile ring, which dovetails into Satanism and cult activity. Any other questions? Well, thanks, folks. I enjoyed appearing before you, and I hope you learned something. Go buy some of my research and make copies and pass it out. Education. <laughs> On the dresser in the master bedroom, and she described it right to a T, and just to make sure, I went down to Sears Roebuck and got a catalog and brought it back, and I said, Alina, pick out the jewelry box in this catalog that was on the dresser. She picked out the jewelry box, it matched. 
Also, she told me that she attempted to ride a rocking horse in the child's bedroom that night, but she couldn't ride it because the spring was broken. The only way she could have known that spring was broken was to have been there the night of the murders, February 17, 1970. So anyway, uh, I submitted a 1,200 plus page report, actually 1,100 plus page, almost 1,200 pages, uh, in uh, March of 1981 to the FBI, Judge Webster with a personal letter, he was director of the FBI, and I said, Judge, I believe this man is innocent and uh, he'd run out of money and, you know, I've continued to work it as I usually do. And uh, I think that the FBI should continue along the lines of my investigation. And much to my surprise, I started receiving, by the way, it also went to the FBI and to the U.S. Department of Justice, the Solicitor General's office. And much to my surprise, my witnesses, my 19 new witnesses, including Alina Stokely, started calling me and saying, uh, hey, Ted, the FBI has interviewed me. They're trying to get me to recant. And I'm saying to myself, that isn't the responsibility of the FBI. The FBI is supposed to gather information, not destroy it. And that was my first clue that we had a serious problem in that case. And then I continued on, and I had a number of other cases that I handled privately. And in each instance, I noticed the uh, evidence was lost, destroyed, stolen. Uh, I noticed uh, that there were strong indications of corruption. So I asked myself, now what's going on here? And over the years, I started gathering this holiday. And uh, we're going to have to move along pretty fast. This is actually a four-hour lecture I'm going to give you today. We're going to do it in probably an hour and 15, 20 minutes. But some of his goals, uh, and the goals that he was commissioned to set up, there were 25 of them. And here they, they are right here. Here's the beginning of it right here. And then rather than read each one of them, I'm going to summarize it, okay, because we've got a lot of work to get into. Number one issue was men are inclined to evil rather than good. Number two goal and issue was to preach liberalism. Number three, use the ideas of freedom to bring about class wars. That's what we're doing today. Number four, any and all means should be used to reach our goals uh, as they are justified, any and all means. Number five, their rights lie in force. That's, we're talking about the Illuminati rights lie in force. Number six, the power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained the strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. And if you will notice, it's been a very, uh, no, very few people know about the Illuminati, so they have maintained their invisibility until most recently. Number seven, advocated mob psychology to obtain control of the masses. Number eight, use alcohol, drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice to systematically corrupt the youth of the nation. I mean, deep, I don't need to document that one about South Central LA, CIA drug operations coming in there. How about uh, Mena, Arkansas? Drugs coming into this country, arms and munitions going out. If you don't believe me, talk to Terry Reed, talk to Chip Tatum, talk to some of these other individuals who I know personally know. During the recent, last fall actually, drug hearings by Mr. Arlen Specter, Senator Arlen Specter, one of the big phonies of Washington, D.C., dozen copies and send it to your friends, okay? The name of the game with me is not copyright. I could care less about copyright. The name of the game is education, education, education. We need to know what's going on in this country today. So anything, any of my research that you buy, please make copies and get them out to your friends. That's what it's all about. After one of my lectures, here's about two years ago, this is why I changed my mind from, and using the word loose knit network to conspiracy. After one of my lectures, a gentleman came up and gave me a book. He said, Ted, in fact, that lecture was specifically on the McDonald case. Ted, here's what it's all about. Take this book and read it. And this is the book, folks. It's called Pawns in the Game. Now, if you don't know this book, 
If you don't know of it, I urge you to, to buy it. I've been trying to buy it, but I noticed one of the vendors out here has it. And please, go get the copy of this book. I forget which vendor has it. Why? CPA book. Yeah. I noticed they had three copies. Are you with CPA book? Huh? Richard Flowers is CPA book. Richard Flowers. Go get this book when it's over and order some more copies. I'm going to order some myself and start selling them in my flyer. Anyway, it's called Pawns in the Game, and it's by William Guy Carr. William Guy Carr had the same problem I did. He wanted to know what's going on in America and in, around the world. He was a Canadian, however, and as a result of his research, he wrote this book. So we have the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati uh, was established in 1776 by a fellow named Adam Weishoff. In 1773, he was commissioned by one of the Rothschilds, uh, House of Rothschild, to put together an organization called the Illuminati. And he culminated his work in May the 1st, 1776. If you'll notice, that's a communing material until uh, about two years ago, up until about two years ago, I kept saying there's a loose-knit network operating in this country involving drugs, pedophilia, pornography, prostitution, corruption, etc., etc. Two years ago, from my research, I'm convinced it's much more serious than that. It's more than a loose-knit network. It is a conspiracy. And you know how the news media comes after us when we use the word C, conspiracy, that C word. Well, they can come after me all they like because I guarantee you right here and now we do have a conspiracy and I'm going to prove it to you here today. Now, one of the things that convinced me and really got me started in this regard, by the way, this conspiracy involves pornography, drugs, corruption, involves pedophilia, involves organized child kidnapping rings, the finders out of uh, Washington, D.C., CIA cover, covert operation involved in the international trafficking of children, terrorism, bank accounts, and the word, and it goes on and on. By the way, I, I strongly urge you to go to my booth after this lecture and get my research, my, my book and my research on missing children. We're going to go into that a little bit in the lecture. But my missing children lecture documents that the finders, an organization in Washington, D.C., the uh, CIA front, it's a covert operation. They're involved in the international trafficking of children. And I have a U.S. Customs report, official U.S. Customs report, in my book on the missing children. So I urge you to get it. It's only 10 bucks. Now, if you buy any of my products, any of my research, I beg of you, I don't want you to buy it unless you make a half a dozen. First of all, let me say thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm, uh, I don't know if you know it or not. Some of you do, some of you don't. Former head of the FBI, Los Angeles, California, retired in 1979, March. And uh, shortly after my retirement, I was asked to investigate the Jeffrey R. McDonald case as a private investigator. He's a former Green Beret doctor, was convicted of murdering his wife and two children in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, February 17, 1970. The long story, I put in about 2,000 hours on the case. <clears throat> when the case uh, first began, my investigation first began, I uh, told Dr. McDonald that uh, I would investigate the matter for him. He had just been convicted and was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I think I'm going to sneeze. I didn't make it. Okay. Three consecutive life sentences. Uh, I told him if he, if I found out that he was guilty, I would no longer be on the case. I would drop my investigation. Much to my surprise, from the evidence that I read, information that I developed over a period of several years, I've established beyond any question of a doubt that this man is absolutely innocent. And on October 25, 1980, I obtained a signed confession from Helena Stokely, the girl in the floppy hat, if you know the case. By the way, uh, there was a, 
best-selling book, Fatal Vision, and a movie out on this. And the girl in the floppy hat said that Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes. They were committed by my satanic cult group. And it was my initiation into the cult that night. And she gave me detailed information about the movement within the house that night, who did what. And I said to her, uh, Helena, how do I know you're telling me the truth? And so one of the questions I asked her, the whole series of questions I asked her, and this is on audio video in some instances, the video, but always on audio. She said, uh, I said, Lena, tell me about the, describe the uh, jewelry box 